Last week, we went through an introduction of Timothy, and we talked about who Timothy is and why this book is written to him and his role in the New Testament. Now, if you want to meet Timothy and know his personality well, you go to Philippians chapter 2. In the Philippians chapter 2, Paul is talking about Timothy, and he says, He is one I love. He's one you love. There's no one else I know in the entire world that's like him because he loves people. He always wants to serve other folks. And so you see that with Timothy, and you begin reading as you go through the New Testament. You see where Timothy follows Paul everywhere. And as we talk about Timothy, you see a lot of things about his, uh, the way in which he would serve other people. Sometimes he would go overboard. You ever meet somebody who goes overboard in helping people so much? That was Timothy. You'll run across him in Acts chapter 16. That's where Paul first met him. And Paul, of course, met him. His father was a Gentile. Looks like he was never a believer. Mother, Lois and Eunice, mother and grandmother, they had raised him up in the scriptures. Paul is very impressed. Timothy is a young man. Most people think somewhere around the age of 30. How dedicated is he? He's circumcised. Not because he has to. He's circumcised so that people will not be offended by his preaching. Because he is of mixed race, they wanted him to be circumcised so when he preached to Jewish people, that would not be a, a setback, something which might offend somebody. So you can imagine how willing to serve other people Timothy would be if he would do that. Now we'll look later in the book, and we see where Timothy is going through many stomach issues because he refuses to drink any wine. Now back in this day, more people drank wine than drank water because the water is usually impure. And so the wine was purif purifying, and it would keep people healthy. But Timothy was so worried about offending other people that oftentimes he would even put his own health at risk. And so as you look at those examples, and we had some other examples we looked through last week, you see a guy who loves other people, wants to do whatever he can to help the gospel to grow, but maybe we'll see later in the book he needs to stand up a little harder. He needs to stand up for the gospel. And that's a little bit of what we're going to be going through today in talking about the point of, of what's going on there. Then we talked about the city of Ephesus. You meet it at the very beginning in Acts chapter 19. Paul finds 11 disciples there. In Acts 20, it's matured and grown to the point in which it has elders. They come to Miletus, which is a coastal city of Ephesus. You see the book of Ephesians, written to the city of Ephesus, of course. Then First and Second Timothy. Timothy is a preacher at this time in Ephesus. Paul had served there for three years in Acts 19. Now Timothy is a preacher there. Later we'll see where John is preaching at Ephesus. And so uh, 1 John is written more or less to Ephesus. 2 and 3 John are written to cities around Ephesus. And in the book of Revelation we see in chapter 2 where John speaks of his home congregation, if you will. And their issue is they've left their first love. Now let's go to our next slide, and when you begin seeing my outline, and my outline is cheesy, but that's okay because I'm teaching the class, uh, the title for our book is Get Right Church, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from three ways over these next few weeks. The very first thing we're going to see is that we need to get ourselves right on doctrine. The church needs to be about Jesus Christ, no one else. Jesus Christ. Don't get caught up in these genealogies. Don't get caught up in fables and theories. Preach doctrine rightly. What is the right doctrine? We'll study tonight as we look at verse 3 and 11. You've got to preach with the right heart, and you've got to preach in the right way. We'll see as we go a little bit later in verse 12, you've got to preach, realizing each one of us are saved by grace. Paul himself says, I am the chief of all sinners. And so we'll go through chapter 1, and we'll look at the idea of the doctrine that needs to be preached to help the church to grow, to set things in order. By the way, the key verse of the book of 1 Timothy is chapter 3, and verse 15. These things I write to you that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the, you know, the truth and the pillar of uh, Jesus Christ. So you see in chapter 1 that idea of, okay, get the doctrine right. Now chapter 2 is get leadership right. In chapter 2 and verse 1 through verse 8, we're talking about prayer and the importance that the church needs a place on people who lead prayer. Prayer is one of the more important things that the church does. And when we get there, we're going to notice how if you go through the book of Acts, you see the church there praying 
more than they're doing any of the other acts of worship. It's kind of interesting because sometimes we, we minimize prayer and we, we pull out some of the other stuff. Then we'll start looking in chapter or verse 8 and go through verse 15. Look at the role of women in worship in church. Then we'll get to chapter 3, look 1 through 8. We'll look at the role of elders, you know, what the qualifications are and of their wives. And we'll look at the end and we'll look at the deacons and their wives and see what the qualifications are. Usually, the only time we talk about qualifications is when we're elder shopping. And the problem with that is, you know, it's about time to find elders. So, you know, you have the preacher, which will give the uh, sermon on the qualifications. And the problem with that is you start hearing that sermon, and instead of listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying, we're looking around thinking, okay, he might work. Uh, I don't know about that guy. I don't know. Maybe that guy will work. And we get kind of a personality thing going. And so it's good to cover First Timothy at a time when we're not shopping for elders and not shopping for deacons. And maybe we can slow down and look at some of these qualifications and see what they really mean before we start attaching personalities and people to them. And then the last two chapters, when we look at chapter 4 and chapter 4, 5, and 6, we're going to look on the idea of ministry. What is it that you preach to the slaves? What is it that you preach to widows? How is it that you need to preach to wealthy members and to poor members? How is it that you need to preach and treat your elders if you're a preacher? How is it that you work to get the congregation to be together? And as a matter of fact, preachers, how do you preach to yourself? So that's what you're going to see when we look at verses 4 through 6 or chapters 4 through 6. So it's get right church. And the idea is get yourself right in doctrine, get yourself right with the leadership, get yourself right in ministry, and when you have those three things going, the church can grow, the church can prosper, and the church can be the bulwark or the pillar of truth, which God intended for it to be. So pretty easy stuff as you go through there. All right, so let's go to our next slide and see what we're going on, what we have going on there. And as we get there, let's go ahead and read the scripture. Go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's hang out looking there at verse 3, all right? We'll go ahead and read the whole thing. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay here in Ephesus, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to uh, myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of the command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And uh, yeah, verse 6. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We note that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also note that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, for ungodly and sinful, and for unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders, for liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he has entrusted to us. All right. Now, as you go through that, one of the first things you're going to notice is the goal of teaching is to be in line with biblical truth. When you're teaching, you want to line yourself up with biblical truth. And so that's one of the things that you're going to notice as we run across here. Many people come across in different ways. Uh, the first person is going to say, listen, if you teach a lot of theology and doctrine, all that's going to do is divide the church. And so let's just focus on what unifies us rather than what makes us different. Now, that's the ecumenical movement, and that's the majority of what denominations are doing now. Most denominations don't look at their distinctiveness, but instead they try to say, hey, listen, we're all on a different road to heaven. We're all on a different path in which we're going to. That's not what the Bible teaches. And we'll see several times as we go through this passage, sometimes as teachers, we're going to offend people. Sometimes as teachers, we're going to divide. Jesus says, realize, I've come, and I'm going to divide households, mother and father and brother and sister. Many people will be divided because of the gospel. Other people come and say, well, listen, if you really love somebody, you wouldn't offend them. You're not allowed to speak truth. All right, if your wife comes up to you and says, how do I look in this dress? 
Are you allowed to say the truth? Well, you know, sometimes it's best to couch the truth in different ways, right? You know, how do I look in this dress? Oh, look, there's the kitty cat, you know, something like that. Well, you could say that as far as home relations. But in the Lord's church, you better preach truth. In the Lord's church, you had better preach those things that are right and those things that are important. Now, you have the other other side. Um, ben Shapiro and several people, he actually quotes um, ancient Greek philosophers, but he oftentimes is known for having a saying that says, some say truth has no feelings. He says truth has no feelings, so deal with it. And one of the things that is his stick, what he likes to do and try to get people to listen to him, is he tries to many times just offend people. And, you know, he wants to just stomp on them and prove that he's right and just show them how it is. And you've probably met preachers. Maybe there's not as many of them today as there used to be. But there used to be some preachers who their entire goal was absolutely to offend. They wanted to stomp on people. They wanted to shame people. They wanted to show all the ways in which they're wrong. And sometimes perhaps that was effective, but usually not as much. And so when Paul comes in here and he begins talking to him about the goal of biblical truth, he's letting them know that preaching the gospel needs to have two parts. It needs to be preached the truth in love. Now, have you heard that before? Ephesians 4, 15, preach the truth in love. You need to love the person you're preaching to. But you need to love them, and more importantly, love God enough to preach the truth. You've got to have both. One of the reasons why some churches don't grow the way they should, one of the reasons why perhaps we don't have the conversions that we expect, is because we're missing one or the other of those two things. Some just love everybody, and because of that, they hold back on truth. They don't want to say what might offend somebody. And some people are so hard on truth that really they don't show any love at all. Instead, they're showing pride and arrogance. And so what you see coming through here is Paul, as he's cranking up and opening up this part, is saying, preach the truth in love. Make sure that you preach in a loving spirit, but boy, make sure that you preach that truth as well. So, all right, so let's go to our next slide. Looking there in verse 3 and 4, we see that he's told to preach Christ and not himself. Here's the myth versus the message. The myth versus the message. It was common back in this day, especially among Judaizing teachers, to teach what's called fables. You've read fables, Aesop's fables and things such as that. And what you would do, at least back in the first century, is you would take a Bible character and you would make a story about that Bible character. Very rarely was it actually, you know, something that that person did, but you would make fables up about those certain people as you'd come across. And oftentimes people would do it with that, and they'd find somewhat obscure in one of the genealogies, and that was a common thing which people would do in the first and second century. And it was something which people greatly enjoyed. If you read... um, apocryphal books. Maybe you can find that in the library or find it online. Uh, You can read in the Gospel of Barnabas. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Gospel of Barnabas. Probably not because it's apocryphal. It, It is a fake. It's not like our Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But as you begin reading through that Gospel of Barnabas, you see Jesus as a young child. They're trying to fill in the time between Jesus being born and the time that Jesus was 12. And Jesus is out fishing with his friends, and, you know, he's trying to, get, trying to get fish. You know, he's about 8, 10 years old. And all of his friends begin catching fish. And because their bait is better than the bait that Jesus has. And so Jesus gets upset, turns to them, and turns all of his friends into frogs, uses them as bait, and catches fish. That's an interesting story, right? Did it really happen? Absolutely not. And you know what? I just wasted 30 seconds of your life telling you that. Well, sometimes 
People will come up with these stories. People will come up with these fables. And you might find preachers today who get these wild, harebrained theories. And they'll start telling you theories about what the last day is going to look like. And they'll start coming up with this idea of a rapture or They'll come up and they'll be able to talk to you for an hour about using this translation or that translation. And they have all these things. And sometimes when they're talking about translations or things, and perhaps even about the end times, sometimes maybe it's true. But people will get caught up in that, and people will get so worked up in that that they never learn the gospel. And Jesus Christ is never glorified. Instead of hearing their sermon and leaving and saying, man, we've got a great Savior, they say, wow, that was the smartest preacher. <coughs> Excuse me. That was the absolute smartest preacher I've ever heard. Now, when a preacher has a goal to be the smartest guy ever and always have the new fable, the new story, the new doctrine, or the new twist, you run into danger of having someone who's teaching these fables or genealogies and getting caught up to where they're not teaching the truth. Again, sometimes those genealogies and some of those lessons were true, but they were a waste of time because instead of preaching about the death, burial, and resurrection, instead of teaching about how a person can be better and get to heaven by the grace of Jesus, you ended up going on some wild goose chase and maybe even learning some trivial facts, but nothing was accomplished to help people to grow. Sometimes we're that way. Jesus talked about the Pharisees being like this. He said you'd, you would strain out a gnat because a gnat's impure. So you'd strain out a gnat, and he says they turn around the other side, they swallow this camel in Matthew 23, 24. And so Paul, seeing that these preachers are this way, everybody wanted to be better. We see about these folks over in, across the sea there in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 1, they're preaching Christ out of selfishness, out of pride. When Paul sees that, he says, Timothy, I charge you. See that in verse 3? It's like a general giving somebody a, 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 an order. I want you to preach Christ. I want you to preach the gospel. Timothy, don't worry about being the smartest preacher these guys have ever seen. Don't worry about what everybody thinks about you. Preach Christ. Put Christ first in every single thing which you do. And that brings us down to verse 11. And when you get to verse 11, as he's talking about these guys preaching this false doctrine, he says... Preach truth because that's what's committed to your trust. That is the most important job that you have. All right. If you play sports, especially if you play a team sport, maybe it's in basketball, maybe it's in football, maybe even if it's in soccer, each position has a role depending on where you're at. In basketball, your forwards, your guards, your center, all those people have a role that they play. Now, we can go through and talk about what each position is supposed to accomplish. But to win a game, each position needs to fill their role. Paul says, listen, as Christians, your charge is to keep the main thing the main thing. Preach Christ. It is your charge. It is what's been entrusted in you. It is the most important thing that you have. Okay? That's, that's super, super, super important. All right, let's go to our next slide here. What is the purpose of the law or the purpose of the command? We're going to look at us as Christians, especially if you're a teacher. And we've got to have three things going on with you. It's love. That love has to come from a pure heart. That love has to come from a good conscience. And that love needs to come from a sincere faith. All right. Looking at that just on the surface, it sounds like he's saying the same thing three times. But he's not. If you're to be the teacher that God wants you to do, the very first thing you've got to do is have love from a pure heart. Your heart, your mind... Your motivation has to absolutely 
be in the right place. Remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7? Samuel has been given the job to go anoint another king. The first one didn't work, Saul. So we get around Saul. We're, going, we're shopping for a new king here. And, of course, he begins seeing all these sons of Jesse. One is tall. One is good looking. You go through each one of these, and, you know, Samuel's like, man, this looks great. Oh, yeah, he would do well. And God says, no, nope, no, nope, none of these are mine. None of these are the ones I want. And he said, Samuel, you're using the wrong criteria. The man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And so, of course, Jesse brings in his youngest son, David, who's short, who's ruddy, who's young. But God sees him, and God says, that's my man. That's who I need right there. Well, that pure heart is what you need as a Christian. What's it mean to have a pure heart? Well, it means that more than anything in the world, you want to please God. More than anything on this earth, you want to please God. Now, one of my sons, I'm not going to tell you which one because people might make fun of him, but he has found a girl that he likes. She lives in a different city. They go to college together, all that sort of thing. And I play with him several times because I've noticed 9.30 every night he disappears. He wants to talk to her on the phone. And so usually about 9.25, I'm like, okay, it's time for us to do this. And he's like, uh, you know, he loves his dad. At least I tell myself that he does. He loves his dad, but right now he really wants to please her over everything in the world. Okay, if you're going to be a good Christian, especially if you're going to be a teacher, there has to be one person you want to please. You know who that is? God. Now, once you take a teaching role, James 3.1 tells us it's a tough job. Once you become a preacher, it gets tough because there's sometimes you got to put yourself in a situation that is super awkward. There's some times where you got to go, oh, John the Baptist, you know, you brood of vipers who warned you of the coming wrath, you know, all that business. And sometimes it's hard to speak up when people who you love and respect are doing wrong. But how do Christians have the fortitude to speak up, especially somebody somewhat timid like Timothy would be? You've got to love God more than man. And you've got to want to please God more than you want to please people. And so that heart absolutely has to be pure. You need to want to please God above everything in the world. And so the purpose of the commandment, that love must come from a pure heart. You've got to want to put him first and foremost in everything in the world. Secondly, it has to come from a good conscience. You've got to live what you preach. It does no good when you talk to your kids and you tell them, do as I say and not as I do. And one of the things that a lot of preachers, especially denominational preachers, run into is they want to live just like the world. Then on Sunday, they want to wear their suits. You know, you see these guys on TV. They want to wear their suits and they want to preach these eloquent sermons. And you hear later on the news, oh, this person did this or oh, this person did that or whatever else it is. They're suffering from not having that clean conscience in putting things the way it needs to go. Physician, heal thyself, as the scriptures would say. How else did Jesus put it? This is how he said it. In Matthew chapter 7, before you start looking for that speck to fix in everybody's eye, you need to take that big old beam out of your own eye. When you're not living right, it's very difficult to correct someone else to encourage them to live right. And so Paul says, listen, Timothy, if you're going to do this job, if you're going to work on setting these things in order, Titus chapter 1, verse 5, you've got to love God more than anything else. You've got to love God more than you love people. Secondly, you've got to live what you're preaching. You've got to have that clean, that pure, that good conscience, which is there. And number three, you've got to have faith. That love from a sincere faith. Do you really believe this stuff? 
that we read in the Bible. Do you really believe in God? Do you really believe in the Word? Do you really believe in Jesus? We went through a rash, oh, I'd say about three months ago, of people in Christian groups, Mercy Me and some of those others, you know, these Christian rock groups, contemporary groups, where these people were just coming out of nowhere and saying, listen, you know, I've been singing these praises to God and writing these Christian songs for 20 years, making my living in this way, and I really never believed in God. I'm actually an atheist. Most of them just couldn't make it in a rock world, so they said, oh, look, we're going to be Christians for a while, wear skinny jeans, and, you know, we'll make our own career this way. Well, it's coming to the point where many of them, in two or three different bands, it happened all at once, said, you know what, we really don't believe any of this. You've got to be sure, if you're going to be a teacher, that you really believe what it is that you're saying. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and He's a reward of those who diligently seek after Him. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. So those three things, as a Christian, those three things are what we need. You've got to want to please God. You've got to be willing to take care of yourself, keep yourself clean. You do that by confession to God. You do that by Christian living, and then you've got to believe in Him. You've got to know that God will take care of you, and you've got to be faithful even to the point of death. Now, let's take an aside and go into this next slide. Look at some of the motivations. Or five traits of false teachers. What are five traits which false teachers have? Now, this is more or less a summary. We're going to back up all the way back to verse 3 and go all the way down to verse 10. Uh, some, some of those I have marked, some of them I probably don't. Five traits of false teachers that you see going through here. First and foremost, they're motivated by pride. They are, oh, who is the guy in uh, Numbers who uh, preaches because he wants to be paid? Do you remember? Balaam. Balaam, yes. Okay, that's right. If I would have thought donkey, I would have come to Balaam. Okay, Balaam, all right. Balaam is a prophet of God, but he's a prophet for profit, right? Okay, he's a prophet for profit. And so he's sitting here, and you know, all of his life he's had to give, you know, an oracle or two to this Gentile nation, this pagan nation. It's been a pretty good living. Well, Israel's coming through, and somebody says, okay, I'm ready to pay you. You need to go up here and denounce these people. And on the way, God says, nope, nope, (laughs) these are God's people. You're not allowed to do it. And Balaam's like, dude, that's a lot of money I'm giving up. So he comes home, they ask him again, he's like, man, you know, I want to, and God's like, no, you don't, and he's like, I I want to get paid. And so finally he decides he's going to go, and his donkey won't let him go, he beats his donkey, his donkey runs him into a wall, and then he falls over, and the donkey begins arguing, and Balaam is so messed up that he begins arguing with his donkey, right? All right, when you argue with your pets, you have an issue. Me and my cat, we argue about every other day because that's just how cats are. But if you're Balaam, don't argue with a donkey. The donkey says, look over here, and there's an angel who's waiting to kill you. This is not a good idea, Balaam. So Balaam ends up giving a prophecy halfway to try to still get paid and try to still please God, and he's right there. An issue that happens with a lot of teachers is they're in it for pride, they're in it for money, they're in it for the acclaim of people. And if you want to please people, it's very hard to please God. You've got to have that pure heart that we talked about just a second ago where you put God absolutely first. One of the reasons why I got so many Christians today who sing praises to God in church and then go cuss at the plant is because they're pleasing people rather than pleasing God. One of the reasons why so many of our church members will have affairs and so many of our church members will do this or that or whatever else, and it's not that many, but it feels like it because one or two every couple years is too many. It's because people are pleasing themselves instead of pleasing God. Pride. Pride is the ultimate sin, and maybe every sin goes back to that. Number two, they've got a new message. Johnny Ramsey, a preacher from many decades ago, I used to always love him. He had a saying, if it's new, it ain't true, and if it's true, it ain't new. 
Well, in a sense, that's right. In a sense, it's not. A preacher, a teacher, a Christian presents truths, but you've got to present them in a new and interesting way. But when a person comes out with a totally new doctrine that nobody figured out for 2,000 years until this guy blessed us with his presence, be careful. Because sometimes they're stroking ego more than they're pleasing God. Number three, they use, but they misuse the Bible. They may quote scripture, but they're not quoting it in the right way. Notice Satan in Genesis 3. God said we shouldn't eat this fruit lest we die. Did God really say you shouldn't eat this fruit lest you die? He added that not right there. He used God's words, and you can sure see that in the original language. He just added a negatory in the middle of it and tried to slip it by Eve. Interesting. Now let's go a couple centuries later, Matthew 4. Guess what Satan's doing? In the second temptation, he's quoting the book of Psalms. Hey, listen, Jesus, if you throw yourself from the temple, my Bible says, he would be doing if he was doing it today, my Bible says that if you throw yourself down, the Lord's not going to let you dash your foot on a stone. It says the angels are going to save you. He's using Scripture, but he's using it in the wrong way. Maybe you've heard some of these preachers on TV. They'll say, okay, here's what you need to be, this is what you need to do to be a Christian. They'll look over in Acts 16 and they'll say, okay, there, verse 30 says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And they stop there and they say, okay, all you need to do is believe. They're using scripture, so it's got to be right or not. Because look at the context. Paul says, you need to believe. Then you get to verse 31, and you see the repentance. He washes the stripes off of the back. And then you see in the next two verses where they go at midnight, he and his family, and they're all baptized. Then you see in verse 34, he is rejoicing, having believed. You see that idea of belief is not just mental assent, but it's repentance and baptism as well. But a lot of people use verse 30, and they say, well, okay, I use the Bible, but they're misusing it. When you have someone preaching to you the gospel, be like those Bereans in Acts 17 who study to show themselves approved, to, to, to see if those things that are being written are the case or not. Know your Bible. Know your scriptures. Number four, they're dogmatic. You had better Believe like they believe, even if it's opinion. Even if they find it in first oddities or second opinions, you'd better believe just like they do because they're smarter than you. And because they're smarter than you, because they have more Bible degrees or they've been from a bigger church or whatever else, they're going to be dogmatic that you need to follow whatever it is that they follow. And they don't realize that there has to be room in the Lord's church for opinion. They're dogmatic because of their pride, going back to verse 1. Number five, they love to argue, and yet they never really obey. 2 Timothy 3, 17, Paul describes them and puts it this way. They're always learning, but never come to knowledge. Very rarely can you pin them down to truth. This is truth, this is immovable, and this is how it is. They kind of want to just go back like a wave of a sea so that they're not pinned down. Those are some of the traits that you have there of false teachers. All right, let's go to our next slide. Let's look at verses 8 through 11. Now, 8 through 11 was a little difficult for me as I was getting ready for this lesson because to me it looked like it was out of place. It's not. You just have to understand what Paul's line of thought is as he goes through here. I I was reading through it, putting the class together, and I was saying, okay, here you see Hey, Timothy, preach with the right heart. Timothy, preach with sincerity. Timothy, watch out about false teachers. And suddenly Paul seems to change gears and he says, okay, now the law is good if you use it rightfully. And then he more or less goes through the Ten Commandments. If you begin reading those lists of sins, what he's doing is he is summarizing the Ten Commandments. You find all nine of them. You don't get number 10. Number 10 is do not covet. And what he says is, hey, listen, all these other sins that are there which would be coveting as you go through. So he lists off the Ten Commandments. And to me at first, that kind of seemed a little bit 
out of the way. But remember what we said in that earlier slide, bringing it here to, to us now. They use Scripture, but they misuse Scripture. Some of these teachers were pulling genealogies. Some of these teachers were bringing obscure characters out of the Old Testament and making fables about them. And they were misusing the law of the Old Testament, the law of Moses. Some of them were saying, listen, you can be a Christian, but you need to be a Jewish Christian. They're making hyphenated Christians. You ever see hyphenated Christians nowadays? Some people say, well, I'm a Christian of this denomination, or I'm a Christian of this sect. That's not biblical. We're Christians. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm not a Church of Christ preacher. I'm a Christian. That you should be the same way. You're a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. And so you've got to use the Word of God right. Now you go in Romans 7. Paul repeats himself in what he's saying in this very passage as he talks about how the law is good if you use it in the right way. Well, what is the right way? The right way to use the law and to work at the law is to notice that it's pointing to Jesus. A lot of people get worked up. Some people today follow the dietary commands. They won't eat catfish, won't eat barbecue, those sort of things. Some people are really worked up about the Christian Sabbath. I remember one of the congregations, when I first began preaching, I got in huge trouble. I've gotten in huge trouble a few times as a preacher. This is my first case where I got called in with elders, and I thought I might lose my job. You know what I did? I mowed my yard on Sunday. And uh, that was a bad thing because that was a Christian Sabbath. And you were not supposed to work. And so they sat me down and they said, Mark, we want you to go inside the house and watch football. Mo Monday. And I thought, this is the greatest eldership ever. But it was one of those things. For them, some people in that place, they were thinking that we were still under the Sabbath command. And so somehow they had moved the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And so therefore you were not allowed to do anything on the Lord's day. Now, in my more argumentative days, I would have talked about how everybody in our congregation drove more than the Sabbath journey. I would have talked about how we had a balcony and a lot of our people on the Sabbath were walking upstairs. I would have talked about how a lot of people in the church were working on, on Sundays. Some of them were working at plants. Some of them were working at different stores. But I, I thought the better of it. I watched football and didn't complain. But, you know, sometimes people will bring stuff out of the Old Testament. They'll bring stuff, these laws and commands that are here or there. What's the purpose of the Old Testament? Galatians 3 says it's a tutor to bring us to Christ. It's a taskmaster, a schoolmaster to bring us to this place. Romans 15, 4 says those things which were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. As you see what happened to Abraham, as you see what happened to Noah, as you read the writings of David, it gives us patience and hope, faith today. And so we've learned lessons from these guys in times past to bring it to the present. But when you start taking Bible and you start twisting it to fit your agenda, when you start changing this or that to fit what you want it to say, then you run into trouble. Then it gets you into issues. All right. Three lessons I want us to learn tonight. Three lessons. Lesson number one, watch what you say and watch how you say it. You remember that truth and love thing we were talking about earlier? Watch the things you say. You need to preach doctrine, but you need to preach it in a spirit of love. Loving God first, that's why you speak up every time, but also loving people. Lesson number two, if you want to please God, you've got to have the heart. You've got to have the conscience, and you've got to have the faith. Your heart has to chase after God, God first and foremost. You have to cleanse your life. You have to live what you speak, and you have to believe and have faith that he will see you through whatever you face. And number three, the Bible is... is let me say this right. The Bible is perfect, but it can be used imperfectly. Let me say that again. The Bible is perfect, 
but it can be used imperfectly. There are some people who will use Scripture, but they use it to please men. Some people will take Scripture, but they take it out of context. They take it and they begin to follow those traditions of men rather than the traditions of God. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. In vain did these people worship me, teaching the doctrine and the commandments of men. Their, their lips follow me, but their hearts are far from me, as Jesus would say. So that's the three things I want you to take away from tonight. Watch what you say and how you say it. Number two, give God all your heart. Give God all your conscience. Give God your faith. Number three, the Bible is perfect, but be sure that you don't use it imperfectly.